Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Jason Moore, welcome back to the Dulio Cast. The Dulio Cast. Thanks, Brian. I'm, I'm uh, as usual, glad to be here, man. Yeah, it's good to connect with you, and we're still doing this remotely because of Delta, the fucking Delta variant. Yes. Even though we're both vaccinated and fully jabbed, yep. we are, we're taking precautions, but it's good to connect with you. What did you think about this trio of interviews that we just pushed through? Carson Mel, Olivia Taylor Dudley, and Al D. That's I think the first time that we have taken this approach to interview the director, the actors, the producer, yeah. all of one film, and then launch those episodes one after the other over the course of a week. What'd you think of that? I loved it. I really enjoyed all three interviews. And uh, it's just, it's really cool. I really liked hearing a different perspective from each one of them about the movie, Some of Our Stallions, and also hearing the different journeys each, each one of them had up to this point. And honestly, I really want to see more from these guys. I'm very interested in seeing where their career path takes them. I would really like to see more films either written or directed by Carson Mel. And I think Al D is an interesting character. <laughs> I follow him on Instagram, and so I get to see him playing guitar and just being weird. Did you hear of his love songs today? <laughs> I, I have not today. I need to go check that out, apparently. <laughs> oh, yeah. He put up two love songs, and they're, okay. <laughs> they're great. I. I just love him. I love Aldi. He's he's such a magnetic personality. Yeah. And he's so fun and heartfelt yes. and uh, passionate. And, and it's like, how can you not be attracted to his energy? No kidding. Yeah. No, I think he's a he's a great guitar player. I mean, if I don't know if you've seen some of his licks and stuff, but I'd like to see him cut an album. Honestly, I'd like to hear some of his original material if he has any and definitely would like to see him do more acting. I think he did. He think he did a great job. I mean, he's a fine actor. I think he did fantastic. Yeah, I really do. I mean, it was kind of disheartening to hear him say that he doesn't think he'll be hired as an actor again because of his accent, at least not in American movies. Mm -hmm. Because I think he really did well with this English speaking part, and I think his accent was yes, of course, it's super thick. Yeah, and you have to concentrate a little bit to understand what he's saying. But Carson really described this well. He said. You don't have to really understand every word he's saying to understand what he is communicating. That's true. And I think his energy is so fun and unique on, on a movie like this or other movies like this. I think he has a lot of potential as an actor. Yeah, I do too. You know, maybe he doesn't see that as his highest and best use. I think as a producer, he's obviously hitting it out of the park with other films and yeah. is talented. In that department. Yeah, very. But uh, man, I just love LD. We've been messaging back and forth on Instagram, and I think we have a date Oh, set up in Seattle. We're going to go on a date with each other uh, to, <laughs> to get a hamburger, and he's going to show me his favorite hamburger joint in Seattle. Nice. So the next time he's in town, we're going to make that happen. Yeah, he seems like a fun guy to, to have uh, dinner with or have drinks with or whatever. He's very charismatic. Yeah. And uh, not only that, I thought Olivia Taylor Dudley was just absolutely lovely, and I think she's a great actress. I'm just looking forward to seeing what lies ahead in the future for all of them. The fact that they're all really good friends, and you can tell when you watch this movie. You watched the movie, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, could, couldn't you tell when you were watching the film that they had a connection that was sort of beyond the script and beyond the film itself? Uh, definitely a chemistry, yeah. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. It seemed like a friendship. Chemistry. Good friendship, good chemistry, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was really fun to see a unique movie like this, but to also get the inside scoop from them on how it was made and the challenges that they faced, how it all came together, how Carson's script just sat in a drawer for years, and yeah, how it was a different story, and then it, it evolved into what it is now and how that happened. So right. I don't know. I just sort of geeked out on this movie, and I had so much fun interviewing these three really talented creatives. Oh, yeah. First of all, until I watched it, I was just kind of going by what you were saying about it in the interviews and had only watched the trailer. But 
you can't really get a complete picture of what this film is about until you actually watch it. And so, you know, my take on it is it kind of presents itself as a comedy, but it's not just that. It's dark. It has moments where the story goes into these funny, dark themes, kind of uncomfortable themes, dealing with mental health issues and seeing what they're dealing with, just kind of trying to function in society. But it also has these moments where I found myself laughing at these sort of awkward moments that were going on with these guys. And, uh, you know, some of it was just outright hilarious. And then you go into another direction where you're not sure if somebody's going to get murdered or something like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know. I, it's, I don't, I don't want to give it all away because I think the movie speaks for itself. So I think people should just watch it. I, I will say this though. It was not what I expected. And having said that, it went beyond what I expected. So just watch it. Yeah. And a great way to describe it is how Al described it. You know, it's a, a knucklehead movie. <laughs> yeah. I love, yeah. I love that word knucklehead. I know. But, you know, two knuckleheads who are struggling with mental illness, trying to find love. Yes. And um, this series of misadventures happens and they meet Olivia, who is playing a character by the name of Bonnie and, and just comedy ensues. But as you say, yeah, darkness ensues too. And, oh. and you're really on the edge of your seat for some moments. Uh huh. And Mike Judge makes an appearance. He's the gun dealer in, yeah. <laughs> in the, the hotel room. And uh, there's just there's a lot of fun surprises in this movie. So hope my listeners can go check it out. Yeah, please do. So in the news this week, Jason, uh huh. RIP Charlie Watts. Oh, man. We were just talking about Charlie in the last duo cast. Yes, we were. And he had backed out of the Rolling Stones tour. And I think he's like 80 years old or in his 80s. So yeah, 80, yeah. It was not surprising that he would have health issues and maybe need to sit out a tour. But really, this news was pretty sudden and unexpected that he would pull out of the tour. And the discussion in the news was just like, yeah, he you know, has some health issues. And then the next thing you hear, he's dead. Yeah. So anytime someone who was 80 years old passes away, it shouldn't be a surprise, but he's such an icon. Yeah. And the history that he has with that band and the history that our country and the world has with that band. Yes. That really was driven by his beats and his energy. So true. It's a meaningful event to lose someone like Charlie. It's a pretty big loss. It is. Yeah. I, I was really hoping that he would recover and be able to um, either join the Stones on their current tour or maybe do one more tour uh, at a later time. But unfortunately, um, he didn't recover and passed away last week. And you know what shocks me about his death, and I don't really want to make a, a comedic comment about someone's demise, but we've talked before about this. Keith Richards, man. Oh, yeah. The irony. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, not to keep saying it, but out of all of the Rolling Stones in their older years, I didn't expect Charlie to be the first one to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I, and I know that Keith Richards is sober now, and I know I don't know if he smokes cigarettes or vapes or any of that stuff anymore. But oh, he's full on smoking. Oh, he still smokes, huh? At least when I heard his interview with Mark Marin, Mark quit smoking years ago. Uh -huh. I mean, probably a decade or more ago. But it was peer pressure, and dur during the interview with Keith. Mark lit up a cigarette, oh, like man. the first cigarette he had had since he quit. Oh. And so, yeah, Keith was smoking throughout the entire interview. Well, there you go. I didn't know he was not drinking, though. So that's probably part of the equation. Yeah, he, yeah, he got sober a few years back. But, you know, when I think of Keith Richards over the years, I always think of him with the drink in his hand, cigarette hanging out of his mouth, and just kind of slurring his way through interviews, you know? Uh huh. And uh, the fact that, you know, he spent so many years in the 70s addicted to heroin. I, you know, I'm not saying I think Keith should be dead instead of Charlie. I just <laughs> come on. That's, that's not exactly what I'm getting what you're at. Saying. <laughs> no, no. I I think it's great that he's still making music and kicking along. But Charlie was not who I thought would go first. You know, I I hope that doesn't come off sounding bad. You know, I, I really do appreciate what the Stones have given us over the last fifty plus years. And honestly, I hope they keep going for many more years. But uh, at some point, we have to get realistic and realize that we're all getting older. Nothing lasts forever. And so thank you, Charlie Watts. You will be missed. Yeah, I agree. And I think when you have a career like this, you can't help but look at a quote from Dr. Seuss. <laughs> and I think the quote is, don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we have the recordings. We can always just push play. 
and there's Charlie Watts, you know? Oh, he, yeah. Yeah. He has a legacy. He has a legacy. For sure. And we're all in some ways, when we're looking at our own mortality, part of our anxiety about mortality and, you know, how long do we have to live? How much time do we have left? What do we want to accomplish yeah. before we die? And you and I were actually talking about this off mic before we started hitting record. Mm -hmm. And I think some of our anxiety is related to that, which is, what is my legacy? What am I going to leave behind? Right. What am I going to accomplish before I go? And I think Charlie Watts, if he were still here today, would look back on his life and say, you know what? I checked all of the boxes and I checked a bunch of other people's boxes too. <laughs> So yeah. I, I kind of went overboard on accomplishing more than any single human being should ever dream of accomplishing. Right. And this guy fucking did it and he hit it out of the park. He sure did. So um, good for him. And let's just hope that the band is able to continue on and make good music and entertain and bring that type of energy and songwriting to fans and audiences for the next decade. God, I hope so. Yeah. Let's hope that happens. But talk about momentum and just like you said knocking it out of the park i remember when they came out with steel wheels in 1989 and people were calling it the steel wheelchair tour you know but even back then <laughs> and that was in 89 so that's right been a while it's been a while mm -hmm. you know <laughs> so yeah he had a good run and a great run he did yeah so jason you know we usually talk about last week's episode we talk about current events and sometimes I like to talk about shows that I'm watching or movies that I've been tuned into. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make a recommendation to you. Okay. There's a show called The White Lotus on HBO, hmm. HBO Max. Okay. And I watched it. I think it's six episodes long. It's one of the best series that I've seen. Now, it's taken some heat and the Twitterverse has gone after this show hmm. for being too, you know, the show is about white privilege to some extent. Okay. And those themes you can see throughout the show and the characters and the storylines and the plot. But it really also is about the existential crisis that most adults are going through. Sometimes even teenagers are going through at any given time and the personal struggles and challenges that they're facing, even if they are privileged. But it's a very interesting, engaging, fascinating study of these characters who are on this island, Hawaiian island. Okay. It was shot in Maui, I think. But it's funny. It's dramatic. You know that someone in the show is going to die. You don't know who that is going to be oh, wow. until the very last episode. Okay. So the setup is great. It's written and, and created by Mike White, who you may remember the movie with Jack Black called School of Rock. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he wrote that one. I think he directed it too. Nice. And he's done a bunch of other stuff, including a show called Enlightenment with Laura Dern, which is great. Okay. But I just loved it. I was riveted by the storyline and the, the acting was great. It was funny. So check out The White Lotus if you have an extra six hours <laughs> okay. and you're lacking content in your queue. Check it out. Right on. What do we have coming up next, man? Uh, we have an interview with Amber Seeley. Yeah. Amber, I talked to about her movie, which actually premieres theatrically today and on video on demand. It's called No Man of God. And it was written by a guy named C. Robert Cargill, who removed his name from the script after it was made, or maybe it was during production that he removed his name and turned it into a pseudonym called Kit Lesser. Okay. But C. Robert Cargill wrote Doctor Strange, a Marvel movie. Okay. He also wrote Sinister and Sinister 2. Okay. But this is a very different film for Cargill. And I guess there were creative differences with the production team and the director about which way the movie was going. So he removed his name from the script and it proceeded forward. And it's called No Man of God. It stars and is produced by Elijah Wood, who is, as everyone knows, Frodo Baggins from the Lord of the Rings series. That's right. And Elijah was also in a great movie quite a while ago called Sin City. You're right. Directed by Robert Rodriguez, I believe. Uh huh. He plays special agent Bill Hagmeyer, who's a real life character. He was a criminal profiler in the 1980s. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
So he was part of a unit, a criminal profiling unit, and he volunteered to interview Ted Bundy. Oh, yeah, that's right. And so this film actually covers the last four years of Ted Bundy's life when he was in prison. He was fighting his convictions and trying to avoid the death penalty. Right. And Bill Hagmeyer's job was to get Ted to turn over information about where the bodies were buried, literally. That's right. For the benefit of the families and also to get inside the head of a serial killer so they can learn how to track down serial killers. So it was a noble effort by Hagmeyer. But what occurred was this relationship over the course of several years that turned into kind of a friendship between Elijah Wood's character, Bill Hagmeyer, and Ted Bundy, played by Luke Kirby. Oh, yeah. Awesome. I've seen a lot of Ted Bundy material, including a movie called Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile, starring none other than Zac Efron, <laughs> who played Ted Bundy a couple of years ago. That's right. So, you know, I, when I went in to watch this film, I was thinking, okay, another Ted Bundy movie, because there's like documentaries, there's like two, I think two narrative films, um, feature films about it. And like, what are they going to do that's new here right. that makes this worth seeing? So I was a little bit cynical going in, but holy shit, man, this fucking movie was incredible. It, it really is a movie about a relationship. And in some ways, it's kind of a chess match and a, you know, a very strategic back and forth because both Ted Bundy and Bill Hegmeyer want something out of this relationship. So they both have ulterior motives. They both want something from the other. And yet they're making a real human connection at the same time. It was beautifully shot. And I was so surprised by the humanity that could be revealed through this type of on screen relationship. And, you know, in a serial killer, you, usually you don't see any humanity in a serial killer. You see a monster. Yeah, that's right. But this guy, Luke Kirby, was unreal in the way that he encapsulated and just sort of captured the essence of Ted Bundy. And Elijah Wood did great. He's just an amazing actor. I don't really see a lot of Elijah Wood material. I, you know, I didn't even watch the Lord of the Rings series, which is kind of strange because my kids love that series. Right. But I do like Elijah Wood as an actor. And, and after seeing him in this film, I'm, I'm super impressed by him. And also, interestingly, there's an FBI agent in this film who is played by Robert Patrick, Robert Patrick of Terminator fame. So, oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. And you know who Robert Patrick's little brother is? Uh, that would be Richard Patrick. Richard Patrick, who we interviewed a couple of, <laughs> <laughs> a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and the way, it's funny, the way that uh, Richard described his brother, Robert, he said, you know, he, he rides a motorcycle. He's actually in a motorcycle gang. He wears leather <laughs> chaps and the vest and everything. And he's super intimidating. Right. And it's funny because when I was interviewing Amber about this film and about casting this film and how she found Robert Patrick, she said that she, she interviewed him, I think on FaceTime, you know, because of the pandemic, they, they don't have a lot of face to face meetings. And he sent a picture to her of himself just because she was like, what do you look like now? I need to know that for casting purposes. Uh -huh. How much do you weigh? How long is your hair? Do you have a beard? That type of thing. And he sent a picture of him with no shirt on, a leather vest, tattoos, <laughs> <laughs> and this mean look on his face, like he's a hell's angel or something. Yeah, he's a badass. <laughs> and uh, Amber's like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> but it was just like a, all of the interviews that I go into, I go in really having no idea how receptive they're going to be to sharing their story. She has been on a press tour for this film for a long time. And I unfortunately had to take the interview spot that was at the end of the day. So I didn't get to talk to her until I think it was 4.45 PM and she had not eaten a single bite all day long. Oh man. So she was pretty tired and hungry, you know, shoving crackers in her mouth right before the interview. <laughs> like just a minute, I, I need to get some nutrition here before we start. I was a little concerned about her energy level and how into the interview she would be. But man, we really connected and had a great chat about the movie, about her prior work, and about her journey into film. So Jason, I fucking love this job. I love it. And <laughs> yeah. 
I would love it even more if it paid a salary of some kind, but <laughs> for now, for now, I, it's a job that I enjoy doing for free. So I can't wait to share that interview. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, it was a fascinating subject. I mean, Ted Bundy has been this sort of well-known, mysterious type of person for several decades. I mean, you know, he was actually roaming uh, Washington State and Oregon back in the 70s. He was spending time up in Central and uh, stalking women up there and killing women up there. And, you know, it's just always, people have been always fascinated with Ted Bundy. And I remember when he was on trial and representing himself, he was spent a lot of time in the in the libraries of these jails just studying law and represented himself. I went to his same law school. He went to UPS Law School. Wow. That's my old law school, which is now Seattle U. Wow. Yeah. So that was our claim to fame. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. But yeah, a lot of people fascinated with Ted Bundy. There's, there's a lot of movies about him, a lot of documentaries. So I would definitely be interested in watching that film. Dude, you should. It's out today. Check it out. Video on demand. It's a great film. Sounds good. I don't throw that term around anymore lightly when I say great film because uh -huh. you know I don't I don't want to lose credibility. Not every film I see that is connected to a guest interview is great. Right. And and so when you hear me talking about a movie and I don't say the word great, I say intriguing or compelling or right something like that. Uh -huh. You'll know. Yeah. You'll know by my enthusiasm. This was a really fucking good movie, and I think it was to the point of. Oscar nominations for Luke Kirby and Elijah Wood. That's my prediction is there will be at least one Oscar nomination for this film. And hopefully for Amber, Oscar nomination for Best Director. I hope so. Yeah, I'll have to actually sit and watch it with Odessa because Odessa's uh, not into Ted Bundy, but into sort of the psychology. Yeah. She doesn't think he's hot or anything. Well, no, she did say that, yeah, he's an attractive man. And I, he is. He was, a, he, was an, he, was an, he was an attractive man, but he was also a narcissist and he was very manipulative. Right. So, you know, you just, he's one of those guys, just absolutely the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous people in the world. You combine charisma, good looks, and being a psychopath. That's a very dangerous combination. Yeah. Even when he was in prison, he had admirers, female admirers that would do anything for this guy. Oh, it's so weird that dynamic where you know what he's done, yet there's still this attraction to him. I don't get it. Right. Well, my friend, I'm pretty excited about a couple of interviews we have coming up. I'm going to be talking to, I can't even keep track of how many I have scheduled, but there's going to be two film directors I'm talking to next week. I'm not going to go into who they are. We'll keep that as a surprise. Okay. But the one that I'm super excited about, which is on the calendar for September 7th, and probably an October launch date is Jeff Fielder. Oh, yeah. And um, Jeff is someone who I've been wanting to talk to for a long time. I think you've mentioned his name several times. Mark Pickerel mentioned him as a possibility right. to talk to. My friend Brian Hughes has been talking about Jeff Fielder. He's like, hey, I'm friends with him on Facebook. I think it'd be a great fit for your show. And I'm like, okay, I've got all these people telling me I got to talk to Jeff. So I looked into it. I sent him an email and he's in. Nice. So we've got that on the calendar. And for my listeners, Jeff Fielder describes himself as the Forrest Gump of rock and roll because he, <laughs> he shows up he shows up everywhere and in unexpected places. So he plays with the Indigo Girls. He's been a sideman for a lot of different famous uh, bands. He's played with some amazing acts over the years. And he's got his own solo work too. And I just saw him live playing with another guitar monster, Al Johannes. Oh yeah. In Seattle last weekend. So nice. I had the privilege of sitting down at a winery, a wine tasting room in a vaccination only event. You had to prove that you were vaccinated before you could get in. Okay. And I got to see Jeff play solo, just him and his Gibson SG guitars. He had two SGs and it was beautiful. It was so fucking awesome to see live music and feel somewhat safe, still kind of freaky Yeah, to be in a crowd, but it was a risk that I thought was worth taking. And I'm so glad I did. <laughs> I got to meet Jeff and take a picture with him. And then I got to listen to Al Johannes, who is, and I don't say this word lightly anymore either, a legend. Yeah. I mean, this guy plays guitar like I have never heard anyone play guitar before. Unique style. But he's also a bass player. And right. 
He played with Queens of Stone Age. But way back in the 80s, he taught Flea of the Red Hot Chili Peppers to play bass. Nice. And he's even mentioned in Flea's autobiography. So, Oh, yeah. Okay. You know, I talked to Al after the show and it's like, what do you think about an interview? And it was one of those things that, you know, like I talked to Kim Thale of Soundgarden too <laughs> about an interview. He was there at the show. Nice. And uh, yeah, I, I, I was like, well, you know, what do you think about an interview? And, and you could tell when I was talking to Kim that it just wasn't going to happen. <laughs> he's not. You know, he's going to yeah. say, yeah, you know, just, you know, contact my management and maybe we can make something happen in October or something. <laughs> but with Al, I felt like, okay, maybe there's an in here. And so he gave me his email address. I emailed him. And he emailed me back like within minutes. He's like, I'm in. Let's do this thing. Sweet. So we're still trying to work out the dates. And I think I'm going to try to do this in person like I did with Mark Pickerel, because with folks that have a really deep story to tell that goes back a long ways and is super connected to the Pacific Northwest, like I am, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just kind of want to be there in person. And I really would love to be in some type of recording studio setting to chat with him. Jeff, I think is too busy for an in-person interview, but I'm really going to try to make it happen in person with Al Johannes. Well, I'm looking forward to that. Wow. Yeah. Talk about some talent. Jeez. Me too. Me too. I'm so impressed. The night before I saw Al and Jeff at that wine tasting room, Eddie Vedder introduced Al at another venue. <laughs> um, so Holy crap. That's how connected he is. I mean, he's on Instagram with Matt Cameron right now. He's like recording with Matt. Jeez. And so- yeah, he's, he's super connected, but more importantly, I mean, just musically, he's so talented. He's from Chile, and his musical history is is fascinating, you know, the path that he took, and I can't wait to learn more about it. Nice. Well, Jason, my friend, thanks for talking to me about the Carson, Olivia, and, and uh, Al D episodes, chatting about the movie. That was fun. Some of our stallions, Charlie Watts, White Lotus, Amber Seeley, Jeff Fielder, Al Johannes, this was a rich conversation, and thanks for joining me. Don't forget Ted Bundy. <laughs> How could you forget <laughs> Ted Bundy? How could you? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I, like I said, I really appreciate it. I love doing this. I like catching up with you, and so anytime, man. All right, man. You have a great weekend. You too, Brian. Hey, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path.